Numbers 20. Numbers chapter 20. And uh, while you're finding it, or after you found it, because it would be kind of hard to do these two things at once, I want to invite you to uh, stand out of respect for the reading of God's Word. Numbers 20. And Don, as we read our scriptures this evening, we're going to read verses 1 through 5 to get started. And then we will pray and get into it. Are you excited to be in the house of God tonight? Amen. Would you turn to your neighbor and say, good evening, neighbor. Aren't you glad it's not David Wyrick pulling the strings of the conversation tonight? Numbers chapter 20. I always get nervous when he starts into that. I don't know about you. And let's look together. Let's read it in unison, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin in the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron. And the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord? And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our cattle should die there? And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt, to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. Father, tonight I pray that as we look once more at the children of Israel, and we consider tonight this idea of ripple effects, Lord, I pray that uh, you would open the eyes of our heart tonight, that as Brother Charles prayed earlier, we might see wondrous things from thy law. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts to this word tonight, that we might be conformed more into the image of your Son. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, do a work in us, that you might be able to do a work through us for your glory. Blessed tonight, I pray, as we look into your word, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So church, the whole concept of this study is the reality that we're not there yet. And so we are learning from Israel as they travel towards the promised land. And we do understand, don't we, church, that these things are written for our learning. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 11 tells us so. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, Brother Don will get that on the screen for us so that we can see it this evening. It, it refers, Paul is reminding the, the, uh, the church there at Corinth that the things of the Old Testament in particular, some of these stories that we are considering in our study, they are written for our learning. And so church, we, we look at the children of Israel and we learn, we use them as examples for how we ought to live and how we ought not to live our lives. So as we have looked at the children of Israel, what are we doing? We have learned that God brought them out of bondage so that he could bring them into blessing. I think we've got to understand the big picture. God brought them out of bondage in Egypt so that God could bring them into blessing. And when we understand the big picture, we realize that though they faced difficulties along the way, there was no difficulty that they faced that could derail what God had determined to do. Church, that's good for us today. How many of us understand that God brought us out of bondage that he might bring us into blessing? God saved you and he has a plan for your life. The Bible says, eyes not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. God brought you out of bondage so that he might bring you into blessing. And will we sometimes face difficulty along the way? Buddy, you better believe it. But we got to understand the big picture. Because when we understand the big picture, we realize that there is no difficulty. None. No difficulty that I face that can derail 
what God has decreed for me. We learn over and over and over again that though they failed God, God was faithful to them. In so much that we see in Nehemiah 9 in verse number 21 how it talked about how their, their feet didn't swell and their shoes didn't wear out. God took care of them. He fed them every morning. He gave them all of the things that they needed. And we can learn as we look at Israel that we can trust our Father. We can trust our Father. Now, this is an important note, church. When we come to Numbers 20, we have to understand that time has passed. The last time we left the children of Israel, uh, they, had, they had just rejected God's plan. We saw them tell God no at Kadesh Barnea. And then we saw Korah's rebellion. Korah, Dathan, and Abihu lead the people in rebellion against Moses and Aaron in rebellion against God. And so we saw the children of Israel and some of their struggles of their 40 years of wandering. But when we pick back up in Numbers 20, time has passed. In fact, the vast majority of the wandering is done. The vast majority, you remember the punishment for telling God no, was that the entire generation that told God no would die. All of those 20 and up, their carcasses, the Bible, would fall in the wilderness. And we see the vast majority of the old guard has died off to this point. This is a new day. This is a new generation. We even see in verse number 1 that Miriam, Moses' sister, had died as well. So the wanderings are about over. If I were to teach this in a, uh, a class, what I would do is I would put a map of the wilderness up on the screen, and then I would trace out in my dry erase marker, I would trace out their journeys with the dotted line, and it would spell out Moses was here, was with a W, and we would underline it a couple of times, and then we would loop them all the way back to where we find them tonight, and that is back at Kadesh. And so time has passed. This is a new generation. And though we have jumped into the future, we're going to see some of the same old failures. But tonight I want to leave you with an encouragement when we're all said and done. But we're going to look at what I'm calling warnings at the waterfall. Ripple effects. Some warnings at the waterfall. Ripple effects. Look with me in verses 1 through 5. The Bible says there, Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. And the first month, and the people abode there in Kadesh, and Miriam died and was buried there. And there was no water for the congregation. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and the people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God, we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. And why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into the wilderness, that we and our Cattle should die there. And wherefore have you made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed or figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. I want you to note first the idea of when problems become patterns. When problems become patterns. You see, this seems like the same old thing that we've seen over and over and over again, doesn't it? It feels like we've been here, done that. We've seen this show. I don't know why we have to watch the episode again. But though it seems like the same thing again, church, it is the same thing with one major difference. It's the same old thing, but it's not the same old people. This is the next generation. This is the children and the grandchildren of, of those who looked at God at Kadesh Barnea 40 years earlier and said, no, we be not able to take the land. This is the next generation. But sadly, though they are the next generation, they murmur and complain just like their parents did. Compare what we just read to Exodus 15 and verse number 24. Where the Bible says the people murmured against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Exodus 17 in verse number 3. And the people thirsted there for water. And the people murmured against Moses and said, wherefore is this that thou hast brought us out of Egypt to kill our children and our cattle with thirst? Boy, that sounds pretty familiar, doesn't it? Almost verbatim. When problems become patterns. 
You see, it almost seems like this was a conditioned response. That the children had fallen into the same pattern, the same step, and they had sinned like their fathers. In other words, when things got difficult, they got difficult. Daddy did it, and now so are they. Can we stop and recognize how amazing it is? It's amazing how deep the influence and impact of the previous generation runs. Problems tend to persist, and people are impressionable. And so if we don't deal with them, do you know what happens? If we don't deal with them, problems become patterns. And we say things like, well, that's just how things are. That's that's just how my dad was. That's just how my granddad was. That's how all the guys in my family are. That's just how my mom was. That's just how we all are. That's just how boys are. And we we see it and we excuse it and we deflect it and we explain it. I, I tell you the other thing, how easy it is to see it in others. So-and-so acts just like their daddy. How many husbands have gotten in trouble because they look at their wives and say, you act just like your mother. Which, for, if I were to say that, it would be nothing but a compliment. I have a wonderful mother-in-law. They were here this morning. and We got to go to lunch with them. That was a blessing. How easy is it for us to see it in other people's kids? See, boy, it's easy to see it in other people. But guess what? It tends to exist in ourselves as well. Whether we're willing to recognize it, whether we're willing to admit it and realize it, problems tend to persist and people are impressionable. And if we don't deal with the problems, problems tend to become patterns. And hear me, we are impacting others more than we know. Can I put something out there to those who have influence and impact in ministry as well? By the way, this extends to us too. In the realm that I've been able to be a part of, I have seen many a preacher boy who who wants to act and sound and do things exactly like some preacher. That's not the goal. We, We ought to want to act and sound and look like Christ. But hear me, those of you who have opportunity to to, to influence kids, the influence we have goes farther than we realize. We are impacting others more than we know. Can I say something tonight that that I, I pray that we all prayerfully take to heart? Patterns, problems do become patterns. But someone has to be willing to break the cycle. Someone has to be willing to break the cycle. To break the chain. How do we do that? We call it what it is. We call it what it is. I have a problem with anger. I have a problem with lust. You call it what it is. I have a problem with my words. I have a problem with my heart. Call it what it is. I have a problem with pride. I look down on other people. Call it what it is. I'm mean. Call it what it is. How do we break the cycle? You call it what it is. You confess it. You confess it. And you work to correct it. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, 28 and verse number 13 that he that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. It is so easy to see it in others. It is so hard to see it in self. God give us grace to see the issues when problems become patterns. Church, that we have to, we have to ask for the grace not to deflect it, not to downplay it, not to defend it, but to call it what it is, to confess it and to correct it. Because when we allow problems to become patterns, you know what happens? Ripple effects are hard to control. These things ripple throughout our generations. Warnings at a waterfall, considering tonight ripple effects. Number one, when problems become patterns, 
I want you to see how the story progresses because this one takes a wild turn. Verse number 6, And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. So far, so good, right, church? This is good stuff. This is exactly what they're supposed to do, amen? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock. Now that word rock there, it doesn't mean a boulder. It has, to do, it has the idea of a cliff. A huge ledge, if you will. Speak unto the rock before their eyes. And it shall give forth his water. And thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So that thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded them. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock. So far so good, right church? But notice what happens. And he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up the rock in his the rod and lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and the beasts also. As we consider tonight ripple effects, we not only need to consider when problems become patterns, church, we also have to consider when problems become personal. When problems become personal. Moses and Aaron go to God just like they should have. God gave them an answer just like he always does. They were to take the rod and go to the rock. It was a cliff, not a boulder. They were to go to the big rock and they were to speak to the rock. And the rock would give them the water they needed. But church, something happened. Something happened between getting the word from God and getting the water to the people. Something happened. Moses snapped. Now, Moses had a lot going on. Moses had led this sniff, stiff, stiff-necked people to the brink of the promised land once before. And their stiff neck had caused him to have to wander in the wilderness for 40 additional years. I'm pretty sure that would wear on a man a little bit. I'm not even 40 years old. I can't imagine. Perhaps, too, if you go back to verse number one of this chapter, we find that Moses had recently had a death in his family. His sister Miriam had died. And I'm going to tell you, his sister Miriam was a big part of his life from beginning to end. You you remember who it was that watched over baby Moses in the basket. Who was it? It was his sister. And who was it that that went to Pharaoh's daughter and offered to find Pharaoh's daughter and a, 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 a woman of the Hebrews to take care of the child, to wean the child. Who was it that made that connection? It was his sister. Who was it that led and sang with the women on the other side of the Red Sea when they crossed out of Egypt? Who was it that led the singing with the women that day? It was, it was his sister, Miriam. You see, Miriam had been a huge part of Moses' life from beginning to end. And now Miriam, Miriam had died. There was loss. Moses had a lot going on, didn't he? There was a lot of stress. A lot of issues, a lot of change, an extra 40 years of difficult wandering with difficult people. His sister had passed away. Moses had been attacked before. But something here happened between getting the word from God and getting the water to the people. Something happened. And that last straw dropped. And Moses snapped. You see, the problem became personal. And when that happened, passion took control. Now, you've got to admit, this is an impressive rant. Here now, ye rebels! Must we fetch you water out of this rock? And then he takes the stick and starts beating on the rock. Buddy, that would get my attention. It was an impressive rant. 
And it wasn't totally undeserved. The problem was that Moses made this about him. And it wasn't. It wasn't. The problem was that though this felt personal, it wasn't. What was this about? Ultimately, this was about providing a picture of Christ. You see, Christ was that spiritual rock. Look at Exodus 17. We're going to read a couple of verses. This was the first time Moses had had been able to bring forth water from a rock and the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chime with Moses saying, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? Verse number 3. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people and take with thee of the elders of Israel thy rod, and with, wherewith thou smotest the river, and take it in thine hand, and go, and Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Oreb, and thou shalt smite the rock. And there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And we see there God provided water there from the rock. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse number 4 tells us that that rock, that spiritual rock that followed them, that rock was Christ. Christ himself draws this comparison in John chapter 7, beginning in verse number 37, when when he tells the people on the last day of the feast, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Verse 38, And he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. For this he spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. You see, the rock was a picture of Jesus. And smiting the rock in Exodus 17 was that picture of Christ. The rock once smitten. Who died, as Hebrews reminds us in chapter 9 and verse number 28. Who died once for all. Once for all. This was about providing a picture that Christ was once smitten. You see, as personal as it felt, it really wasn't about Moses. It was about Jesus. And an opportunity to provide not just Israel, but all people with a picture of what God intends salvation to be. Christians... Tonight, may we understand that for those who know the Lord, the problem may feel personal. But it really isn't. You see, it isn't really about you. It's about Jesus. It's about pointing others to Him. It's about portraying an accurate image of Him. For the world to see. For the Christian, hear me, everything in life, including problems with people, is about Jesus. But church, when problems become personal, the ripple effects are hard to control. We've seen when We've seen when problems become patterns and when problems become personal. But I want you to see how this this account ends. Still with me tonight, say amen. Amen. Let's jump back to verse number 11, Don. The Bible says, And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smoked the rock twice. And water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believed me not. To sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. 
This is the water of Meribah because the children of Israel strove with the Lord. And he was sanctified in them. Did you catch it? Because of Moses' unbelief. Because of his anger. Because he did not lift up the Lord in the eyes of the children of Israel. Verse number 12, the Bible says, Therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land that I have given them. You see, when problems become patterns, and when problems become personal, that's when problems become pricey. That's when problems become pricey. Don't you love how God in His grace still gave water to the people? I love how the psalmist reminds us, Psalm 103 and verse number 10, the Bible reminds us that He's not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Aren't you glad for that tonight? Psalm 130 and verse number 3, very similarly, the Bible says, If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? Aren't you grateful for the grace of God tonight? But church, hear me. When problems become patterns and when problems become personal, that's when problems become pricey. You see, you're going to have to pay a price. The price to be paid for Moses' anger and unbelief was that Moses would not be allowed to lead the people into the promised land. Moses lost the opportunity to lead the people in. He lost the opportunity for ministry. He had glorified himself. He had chosen himself instead of God and it would cost him. By the way, Moses later on would beg God to take it back. He would beg God to allow him in. Deuteronomy 3 beginning in verse number 23. uh, We we see, make sure that's right. Yep, Deuteronomy. and And I besought the Lord. This is Moses at that time saying, O Lord God. Thou hast begun to show thy servant thy greatness and thy mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or in earth that can do according to thy works and according to thy might. I pray thee, let me go over and see the good land which is beyond Jordan. That goodly mountain in Lebanon. But the Lord was wroth with me. He's speaking to Israel here. The Lord was wroth with me for your sakes and would not hear me. And the Lord said unto me, let it suffice thee. Speak no more unto me of this matter. Boy, I tell you, that's a heavy thought tonight. When we allow problems to become patterns and we allow problems to become personal, we can find ourselves in a situation very easily when problems become pricey. In church, we've got to pay the price. You see, we've got to pay the price now. How do we pay the price now? We confess the sin for what it is. We correct the sin in God's grace. We we, we break the cycle by God's grace. We break the chains by God's grace. How do we pay the price now? We subordinate my grief and my gripe to his glory. I recognize as much as it hurts me, it's not about me. It's about him. And I subordinate me to him. I either pay the price now or I'm going to have to pay the price later. But here's the thing about paying later. Deferred payments come with high interest. And sin will always, always take you farther than you want to go. Keep you longer than you want to stay. And cost you more than you want to pay. And when we choose to pay later, we choose to risk future opportunity for God. You see, the Lord's looking for clean vessels. Illustration I often give along these lines is I have a travel mug that I love. It is dear to me. It holds coffee for me on a regular basis. Glory, hallelujah. The fruit of the Spirit in my life is watered in coffee. It's a wonderful thing, George Jenkinson. My travel mug, though, because it chooses to hold coffee cannot and will not be used by my wife 
See, my wife doesn't like coffee. And if it's something that's contained coffee, or could smell of coffee, or could transfer the taste of coffee, guess what Miss Amy won't use? That cup. We have his and hers travel mugs. And the twain do not mix. It'd be a far better thing to be Miss Amy's travel mug than to be my travel mug. And yet the ones that have held coffee for me have lost that opportunity. You see, Christians, when we choose to harbor sin, when we choose to perpetuate patterns, when we choose to hold on to things and make things personal, what do we do? We put ourselves in a position where God can no longer use us like he wants to use us. And we risk losing opportunity to serve God. Now that's hard to hear. But it's Bible truth. But I want to encourage you tonight. Because so often when we hear things like this, our minds do what? Our minds automatically go to past mistakes. Our minds automatically go back to the things that we have done wrong. To maybe those, maybe those points in our lives where we recognize, boy, if we had just done something differently, if we had just turned right instead of left, if we just held our tongue, if, if we just hadn't reacted, if, if we had just thought things through, if we had just taken time to pray, and our minds go back to those pivotal moments where we wish we could do things different. And we all have those moments. We all do. I have those moments. You have those moments. Every one of us has those moments. And we wonder, we wonder what could be if only we had or had not. We wonder what or where we may have fouled out of. Can I encourage you to not, that tonight? That's not where God wants you to be. That's where the devil wants you to be. The devil wants to keep you there in the past because you can't do anything about the past except to make sure that it's under the blood. And so if the devil can keep you fixed on yesterday, then the devil can get you to the place where you'll forfeit today and not even realize it. You see, what God cares about more than anything else is not where you've been, but where you're at. And instead of focusing on what yesterday might have been, can I encourage you? It's not that we don't concern ourselves with yesterday, but church, we don't fix ourselves, fixate ourselves on yesterday to the place where we forfeit today. Get right today. Be right today. Do right today. Recommit today. Because God's mercy and His grace are new today. The opportunities God wants to give us are new today. And so we ought to spend less time worrying about what might have been and worry more so that we are in a place today where God can use us to the fullest capacity that He desires Because our God has a funny way of even taking those areas in which we have messed up and turning them into platforms that we can greater serve Him through. You see, God's grace is that great. It is greater than your sin. It is greater than your past. It is greater than your mistakes. God's grace is greater. And God doesn't want you to sit back and bemoan your past. Get it under the blood and be right Today, because God has a plan for you today. Now, simply put, how you receive this truth will send ripple effects. How you receive this truth will send ripple Ripple effects. The only question is whether or not they will be ripple effects for the better or for the worse. May God give us the grace we need to receive this warning from the waterfall.
Father, we love you.